Right. We'll say good evening to you all for uh, attending what's our third segment of the Land Development Regulations, uh, working with CDA uh, out of uh, South Florida. They're helping us work through the process of updating the Land Development Regulations. And as you know, that's an important part of what we do. In the planning department, we're taking a look at how we can make improvements to the total rewrite. Uh, we've already gone over transportation and affordable housing, and today we'll be looking at the green component uh, of the land development regulations, looking at open space, uh, landscaping, signage, uh, as well as thinking about our streetscapes. And with that, since we've got a lot of information to cover today, I want to turn it over to Richard, who's the project manager for CTA, who will introduce his project team and kind of give you an update as to where we are currently on the work that we've done so far, and then give you an overview as to what we'll be going and talking about for the future. One of the things that we remind you of is that this is a big picture conversation. Uh, the last time we had a meeting, we got down to uh, stop signs and rumble strips, which is a little bit ahead of where we're going to be currently. So as you look at this presentation, again, think about the big picture, the concepts for the entire city. And then as we work our way through, we'll be working on almost block by block as to the particulars as to how we think of green space, open space, and landscaping will be able to improve our community as a whole. So with that, I'll turn it over to Richard and we can get started. Good evening. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for, uh, for coming. Uh, with me tonight, I have uh, Nikisha Smith. Uh, she's a senior planner. And I have uh, uh, Gianna Fioli, uh, who's in our uh, landscape and uh, urban design uh, department. Uh, just a little bit about CGA, who we are. Uh, we started in Hollywood, Florida in 1937 as a survey company. Uh, we've since grown to about 300 employees. Um, we do a number of uh, consulting and regulatory uh, work uh, with a variety of municipal um, uh, municipalities throughout South Florida. Uh, this is a number of the, uh, of the disciplines that we currently work in, and as you can see, planning, zoning, public administration, urban design, landscape architecture, transportation planning is one of, the, um, one of our main segments. Uh, this is just a little bit of our team, uh, who's involved, um, myself, and there are a number of other uh, planners, um, stormwater engineers, anybody who, any sort of regulation that we're looking to change, uh, we want to make sure that, that we run it by them, uh, since they are the experts. Some of the key tasks um, that we were, we were assigned in, uh, in working with uh, the city in, in updating the land development reg is first implementing the, the 2013 Comprehensive Plan Amendment. Uh, that called for some changes in, in the LDRs, uh, resolve uh, a number of inconsistent definitions, terms, and standards throughout the land, the, the code, um, codify some of the current zoning practices uh, that are being done through administrative interpretations, incorporate new standards, um, and then use appropriate uh, graphic illustrations to, to make sure that the point is clear and understandable. Um, there's been some, some major issues that, that staff had identified early on as part of the RFP. Um, again, the first two I had, I had gone over. Um, the third is the incorporation of new standards, programs, processes, and methods. And the reason I have that underlined is if you go to the next slide, you'll see that these get a little bit more narrowed down. Um, so we get into workforce housing. Um, incentive for creating market or, or maintaining market rate, climate adaptation, uh, green building standards, and then the one that's highlighted on the bottom, urban design zoning regulations, include opportunities for form-based development regulations in mixed use and commercial zoning districts. Updates to the landscape architectural standards compatible with proposed new urban design guidelines described above. Update sign signage requirements outside the historic district compatible with proposed new urban design guidelines described above. And then there was complete streets, parking generation. So as Thaddeus mentioned, we had the first two series of workshops last month. Uh, the first one was on affordable housing. The, the second night was on um, complete streets and parking. Uh, so tonight we'll focus on um, signage, landscape, urban design, open space. And then tomorrow night uh, we'll wrap it up uh, with green building, adaptation planning, and, and disaster planning. Same place, same location, same time. Um, so the topics of discussion for tonight, um, in looking at open space, streetscape, urban design, and landscape, they're sort of all intertwined. Um, so it, sometimes you'll hear it, it'll be interchangeable. Um, we will go through them each separately, uh, 
but, but as, you, as we sort of get into the discussion, keep in, keep in mind sort of how they operate globally. Um, signage is also involved, obviously, because it affects what's, with what type of landscape you could, um, you could put on the property. Um, so in, in looking at open space, some of the specific areas we wanted to address um, is there's a lot of variances. I would say almost all of, not all, but the majority of variances that are granted have to do in some aspect with open space. Um, and there's a number of layers of landscape and open space requirements in the code today. Um, there's about 10 approximately. Some of them overlap. Um, you know, we were, we were kind of going through it, you know, trying to figure out, okay, what makes sense? And I mean, th there's a lot there. Um, there's a lot of overlap and um, sometimes it's difficult to understand. So the intent is to really simplify that and, and make it so that, um, that everybody can use it. Uh, urban design, Gianna will get into looking at flexible front yard setbacks, um, commercial uh, whiffs on Roosevelt, internal conflicts. Um, we'll look at mass and scale in relation to front yard, uh, possibilities of a height bonus, um, requirements for curbing, and um, that's it. Outdoor, that should go. Um, for landscape, scenario driven buffer requirements. Um, right now, the way the plant standards are measured are by units, uh, where it's sort of a point system, which we don't necessarily think is a bad thing, um, but what's interesting is there's no set requirement of you have to have a canopy tree. So if you have 40 points, you can put 40 shrubs in and meet the requirement, and we don't necessarily know if that, you know, think that's, that's, that's a good thing. Um, again, promoting continuity of well-maintained landscaping and focus really on uh, standards that are specific to Key West, not standards that you know, might be appropriate in, in, in uh, Georgia. Um, existing conditions uh, are a product of the burdens of development. This is especially with respect to streetscapes. Again, because we have a height limitation, it's forcing sort of everything off the lot. So as things get forced off the lot, they're starting now to, to affect what's in, what's in the right of way. Um, and then looking at street trees and how we can sort of take some of that back. In Newtown, we want to look at what we'll be getting into, sort of the link between signage and le legibility, uh, focusing on the approach that looking at it from vehicular speed, um, setting the size that way, um, and then looking at bringing properties into compliance, whether it be through amateurization uh, versus an absolute deadline. So the first topic that, that I'd like to get into is the open space topic. And so the, it, at first when I, when I was approaching this, I thought, okay, there, there's a number of components. We can look at setbacks. We can look at all of these things on how we build a lot. But let's sort of, for me, the three major components are always impervious surface ratio, building coverage requirement, and open space requirement. So impervious surface ratio is def defined as the portion of land which is covered by building, pavement, non-porous fill, or other cover through which water cannot penetrate. That would include a sidewalk, the swimming pool, your deck. All of those are counted as, as far as the uh, impervious surface ratio. Building coverage is just that. It, it's whatever the structure covers. Um, and then decks anything 30 inches above grade. So this is the current standards. There, there are some variation, but for the most part, for single family, it's 50% impervious, surf impervious surface and 35% building coverage. So what we've looked at is sort of the general, let's just take a 5,000 square foot lot for single family, 10,000 square foot lot, and what does, that, what, does that, what does that mean? What does that yield? So if you have an ISR, obviously it's 2,500. Your building coverage um, or footprint of the building uh, could be 1,700, uh, 1,750 square feet leaving a remaining ISR, or impervious surface ratio, of 750. So what does that mean? That means within that 750 feet, that's anything you can put, you know, your driveways, your additional walks, um, swimming pool, all of those things that can cover the lot. Is that appropriate? Is it not appropriate? So these are, these are the things that we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're continuing to examine. Um, then we get into open space, and what, is the open, what does open space mean? So it's comprised of permeable open, open surfaces. No parking or paved areas shall be included, although active recreation may be counted as open space. So in residential, 35% minimum. Non-residential, it's 20% minimum. And then for mixed use, it's allotted based on the, the square footage of, of that use. So when we add sort of 
open space into the mix, your remaining pervious where you, where you had 2,500 square feet, you have, basically you have none left. And you're still remaining with that 750. So within that 750 feet of, of impervious surface ratio, are you able to get, get what you need on your lot, essentially? Um, is this the driver of the variances? Or is 750, is that appropriate? Um, so these are the things that we're sort of look, looking at in, in coming up with the regulations. Um, so we started looking at, you know, it's, it's really interesting, you know, you walk around town, you drive a bike around town, and, and it's a completely different view. But when you look at it from up above, it's even, it's even more, more so. Um, and you really start to see sort of the push out um, where, where properties are building completely, you know, completely covering their lot. Um, so these, these are two properties that we looked at. Uh, the first one, um, you know, if you can see it, it has quite a bit of, of open space, quite a bit of green on the lot, um, whereas the, the one to the top, uh, you can see where the additions have been built on both to the front and to the, uh, and to the rear. And then looking at it from the street, um, if you go back, there we go. Um, it has some open space. It doesn't necessarily have landscaping that, that's that attractive. Um, but one thing that's interesting, they have the boat that's parked in the driveway, but the car parks in the street and the swale that's caused sort of a, a ditch. And it's sort of bringing that, those kind of elements into the right of way that, is, that causes the flooding and, and causes, uh, causes other issues. Um, on the flip side, um, the way the cur current code is, you're allowed to go to a one foot setback with a carport. And so as you see, things start to get, get pushed out uh, into, into the street. Here's another example of, of what could be a swale, maybe is a swale, but then has some, some hardscape and trees within, within the public right of way. And we looked at an example in, in Newtown, and th this kind of stuck out. I, I apologize if it's anybody's home, but it's, it was, um, it's almost all completely paved over. And you know, there's a little swath of, of you know, marble rock that, that allows for some pervious. But when you look at it from the street level, um, you see how it's, it's raised. So you have all of the water now from that property coming into the right of way. And because it's so close, I'm, I'm, I'd be willing to bet $100, and I don't like to bet at all, that the majority of, of, the, of the sheet flow from that roof is going onto the neighbor's property. Um, and, and it's interesting, because this is one where you can tell it had a garage, and then it was closed in. Now they have a carport. Um, and it, it's a function of, of you know, people's lives, but at the same token, um, it's now spilling into the streets and, and you know, there, there's a number of issues that are associated with that. So what do you, you, know, what do, you do, right? So do you, do you change the code to accommodate um, these sort of circumstances or do you change the way variances are granted because there's been so many that, that, are, that are being looked at? Um, and right now, the way the, the way the city can grant variances is, is the typical hardship criteria. Um, there's a waiver uh, requirement that's permitted, um, but it's only for landscape requirements. It almost serves as a practical difficulty variance. And then there's administrative variances that are permitted, um, but it it's actually seems like a, a, a cumbersome process to even get through the, the administrative variance process. Um, so one thing we looked at is is twofold, so kind of changing the regulations, but also changing the way we look at variances through a true practical difficulty approach. And with that include alternative development options, um, still have both a, an administrative or board review, but also require some sort of mitigation uh, with, respect to, with respect to the relief that's being requested. So, so what is, a, what is a, a variance of practical difficulty? And it's where little and literal enforcement of the code will create just that, a practical difficulty. Um, so it's not necessarily a hardship, it's, it's more of a practical matter. And the standards are based on the principle that the inability to satisfy some of the requirements in the city's land development regulations are practical difficulties. And valid justifications could be provided for the issuance of the variance where strict hardship standards not satisfied. And so we came up with some criteria for review, and there, there are six of them. So the first criteria is how substantial the variance, the variation is in relation to the requirement. The second would be the effect of the variance that would have on governmental services. The third is whether the variance will affect a substantial change in the character of the neighborhood 
or substantially uh, or be a substantial detriment to the neighboring property. Flooding the neighbor's property or flooding the street would be examples of, of five, um, uh, five and six. I'm sorry, to four, he moved it too quickly. Um, whether the practical, practical difficulty can be alleviated by a feasible method other than a variance. How the difficulty occurred, whether it's the landowner creating the need for the variance, and whether in light of all the above factors allowing the variance will serve in the interest of justice and be in accordance with the spirit of the regulations. So, so what, what we try to do is rather than take, you know, and again, as Thaddeus mentioned, this isn't you know, what's gonna get written into, into code next week. Um, we still have a ways to go. This is, again, to start, to start the process, start the discussion. Um, and, and so rather than sort of take this one size fits all, okay, let's lower the, let's lower the standard or let's do this. Um, let's offer more of a flex, we'll take a flexible approach um, in conjunction with sort of the practical difficulty. And really look at capping the maximum variation. So if, if, the, if it's 35% now, whether there's a range depending on the lot size and, and there would be all sorts of factors that we would look at um, to allevi alleviate any sort of potential issues, that's sort of where, where we look to, to head with respect to this. Um, so for example, open space reduction for single family residential could be limited to a maximum re reduction of anywhere from 1% to 15% of what's normally um, required. And so the way, the way we looked at it initially is, okay, right now staff can give a 10%, um, mostly a 10% adjustment on a number of factors. Um, so sort of one to 9% of that variation, these 10 things could be covered under there that are, that are related to open space. Um, anything above that, so the 10 to 15% would go to the planning and zoning board. And coupled with that would be some sort of mitigating action. Um, lot coverage, open space. So as you're, if you're gonna build, you know, not that that would be encouraged, but if you are building and covering almost all of your lot, um, you know, everybody gets assessed a storm water fee across the board, a straight figure. Is it fair for that person to be paying that same amount of money when they're generating a much more, a larger amount of storm water that's going into, that's going into the right of way? So whether there, be, whether there be an annual surcharge to that property, whether that property now be required to improve or install swell areas adjacent to the property, uh, improve or insp install sidewalks, uh, curb and gutter, or whether there be established a city tree fund, then that they would pay, on, pay under. And again, these could change, there could be others added. These were just sort of examples that we're looking at initially. Um, I, I did want to bring this up because everyone's going to see, you know, there, you can't take exactions and, and we, we, we are well aware. Um, House Bill 383 was, was passed, it goes into effect October 1, um, prohibited, and, and they define what a prohibited exaction is. Uh, and, and basically there has to be that essential nexus to, to a legitimate public purpose. And obviously flooding and storm water uh, would, meet that, would meet that test. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you deal with non-conformities, right? How do you deal with, with these properties that, that aren't in compliance um, and trying to bring them into compliance? Um, so we looked at changes, so we, so we looked at ways of how can, we start to, how can we start to get people to comply, right? It's, it's never easy. Um, you know, normal maintenance you'd, you'd be allowed to do. Um, proposed changes that are not in conformance they would be subject to, a, to, you know, could be subject to a variance process. Go to the next. And there, there's, a, so really the compliance option, and this is a dramatic, dramatic switch, is you, you sort of, you have two, two ways to look at nonconformities. Um, if that nonconformity was approved through some sort of land use review and maintained over time, they would have that legal nonconforming status. The second, part of that is, and this is, this, this is this, the dynamic switch, is those that don't or can't prove that, don't lose, they lose their legal non-conforming status. There's no more grandfathering for those. Um, so what does that mean, right? Does that mean they gotta tear their house down? No, this is only in respect to open space landscape standards. And so really the purpose of the compliant op op option, excuse me, it's aimed at upgrading those non-conformities. So bringing you up to, trying to bring you up to compliance. 
Um, it's not intended to require extensive changes. Extreme impractical, like you're not gonna move your house or you're not gonna you know, have to heighten your building or in order to, but, but there's little things that, that can be done. And so, so the way we looked at, at sort of timing and cost for these required improvements is not to really try to, to stick it to somebody and say, you know what, you gotta do it or you're gonna have a $100 fine a day. That, that's not the intent. The intent is sort of gradual compliance. So as you, can, as you come in for a building permit, the value of that building permit, whatever it is, let's say you're putting a new roof on, $10,000 is, is the value of the improvement. 25% would have to go towards an improvement to correct your deficiency. And whatever that is, that could be planting more trees, increasing the setback, removing something that you put there that shouldn't have been there. Um, so these, these are things that we're looking at to try to get properties who aren't into, aren't into compliance into compliance. Um, on the commercial side, it was a little bit of a different approach. Um, it could be made over several years, depending on the severity. Um, you could look at a compliance period depending on two to five years. Um, the issue with commercial, there's, there, there's so many different types of commercial. Um, and I think it, it's difficult to require this, this percentage value because a, a roof on a commercial property, you know, 25% might be a, a huge substantial amount of money. Whether, whether we go that route, I don't think so, we may, um, but it might work better in, in coming up with a compliance plan specific for commercial properties over a period of time to, to come into compliance. Um, we would also look at, um, you know, obviously for the, historic, for the historic properties and the historic district, whether there would be a waiver that would need to be uh, applicable in, in certain situations. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gianna. Good evening. Um, I'm going to talk to you about urban design, landscape architecture, landscape planting, and uh, streetscapes, uh, particularly when it deals with signage and how the interrelationship of the built environment happens. To follow up on what Richard said, um, remember that these are moving targets. You shift one thing, all the other pieces move, move together because they're all interrelated. Um, so one of the first things that we looked at was this issue of the front setback. We definitely want to celebrate the history that Key West has by celebrating the facades of the historic properties. Particular to Old Town um, in the residential units uh, uh, uses, we think it's appropriate to establish, to revisit this idea of the setbacks, establish a maximum setback environment, um, and then build into the formula a flexible setback that is relative to any abutting historic property, which means that the historic properties adjacent to any property that's gonna have any major rebuild or any addition or reconstruction um, will be set back further so that the historic property has more prominence on the street and is much more legible. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis having a new building having much more prominence on the street where a historic property is set back and is not that, that, that legible. In this second scenario, we think that that contributes to a somewhat degradation of the historic district. So we want to absolutely celebrate um, uh, the, prevalence, the prevalence of those historic structures where they exist. And requiring that any second story additions are adequately set back at an appropriate distance so that the mass of that structure is not negatively impact the legibility of those historic structures when they're seen from the street. In Newtown, we will look at a different scenario. Um, we would not necessarily look at a setback, a minimum setback requirement as it is today, but we will look at a build to line uh, 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 strategy, which means when you establish a build to line, the facades of the buildings have to meet that, that, that new frontage line. What that will allow us to do is to bring the buildings closer to the road, so the, particularly in, um, in along Roosevelt, in large pr properties that could be redeveloped, such as the Searstown property, um, to create a much more walkable, pedestrian-friendly environment, uh, something that is much more conducive to a higher quality of life, um, and that creates a better street presence. Um, 
This could facilitate um, uh, some different methods for negotiating what's gonna be the new finished floor elevations that are established by FEMA, which are gonna be substantially higher than the crown of road. So one of the things that we have been looking at is can you provide parking, uh, short-term parking that would meet those commercial establishments 30 minute maximum so that you get that continuity of movement with, where the majority of the long-term parking happens on the rear of the property. Or doing away with the storefront parking altogether, having all the parking on the rear and turning that whole frontage into a linear park that will essentially extend for almost two miles with this grandiose water view of the, um, of the Gulf. Um, the trade-off of, uh, of the minimum setback to the build two line strategy is that it gives us an opportunity to get something in return from, from that uh, uh, st strategy for the city. And this can be an upgraded pedestrian quality, street trees, plazas and open spaces that are dedicated by the, um, by the new, new development that may be at, at, at corner features that provide small plazas with water features that can be spaces for respite. Um, they really become about creating a, a sense of community and a sense of engagement with the urban environment. Particular to the commercial driveway widths on Roosevelt, we definitely want to look at minimizing how many driveway accesses there are on Roosevelt and starting to encourage the aggregation of some of these lots so that there can be access happening on the rear or, or, or the side of the properties. What this will do is that this will eliminate all the left turns off of Roosevelt into the properties, which will allow us to aggregate the medians so that then we can actually have street trees in the median condition. Presently, because that is an FDOT roadway and because of all the left turns in and out of the parcels, there are so many sightline restrictions that right now what you end up is with a barren, desolate, concrete, asphalted environment. And we definitely think that the potential is there to create a beautiful entryway into Key, Key West by making these good urban design moves. Um, this again will generate greater walkability it, by pushing the buildings closer to the right of way. It will increase the visibility of those co commercial establishments so that uh, the merchandise and the products and the services that they're offering don't need to be uh, uh, set back behind a sea of parking, trying to get attention, but they're much more present. Um, and of course, it increases that overall streetscape opportunity uh, throughout the end corridor. When we talk about building mass, we would also build into the LDRs restrictions as to maximum wall planes so that we deter these large big box development. So what we're doing is that we're starting to take the big masses, build architectural articulation language into the, um, into the language that starts to force the building to break down the mass so that it doesn't look like a huge blank wall, um, as you see there. Um, it allows the building to become much more humanized. It creates pockets and, oppor and, and opportunities for landscape to grow, engage with the facade, um, and be more in tune with the scale and the character of Old Town that we find that there's a lot more smaller uh, uh, um, uh, uh, assemblages of qualities. Additionally, as redevelopment happens, and we understand that as flood insurance comes in, its cost is gonna ge generate um, a huge catalyst for redevelopment to begin to occur. Um, we wanna make sure that a new redevelopment that comes in doesn't displace the, the individuals that cannot afford million dollar apartments, right? So we wanna incentivize the inclusion of affordable housing. And one way that we can do that is by providing height bonuses, but ensuring that those heights are set back from any facade so that when you draw the sight line from anybody standing at the sidewalk, 
those additional heights are out of view. So therefore, it, it's, it doesn't have a negative impact on the experience of the pedestrian as they see the building or read the, the, the facade from the street. In addition to that, we will build in, or we're thinking about building in, um, some language to require that that additional height would have some barricades in terms of landscape barriers and screenings to soften it to ensure that um, there is an opportunity at the roof level to capture water, to increase the sustainable footprint of these buildings and to uh, increase its carbon sequestration um, uh, 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 quality. Now, when we talk about curbing, there is a, there is a requirement in the books um, that states that curbing is required um, uh, around your soil areas. And we actually think that this is a good thing so long as the curbing is used in a way where it can serve an opportunity to create rain gardens. This will allow us to ensure that um, uh, it disincentivizes the future use of those swales for parking um, and it aids in the recapturing of stormwater management um, when drainage uh, becomes an, a necessity. So overall, it'll help to increase um, the overall green footprint of the development that occurs. When we talk about landscape, uh, the code right now is a scenario-driven uh, 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 buffering requirement strategy. So what it looks at is if you have a single family next to a multifamily that is treated different than a multifamily next to a commercial or two commercials next to each other. So these scenarios, these relationships are what drive the buffering requirements. Um, in addition to that, there are descriptions of low, medium, and high impact uses, but there's no tools for staff in order to be able to develop and determine what exactly defines a low, a medium, and, and a high. So we definitely want to flesh th those out and help staff with the quantitative mechanisms um, to determine what categories each one of these developments uh, 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 fall in. Now, some of the contributors of these are issues such as noise, outdoor parking, exterior storage, height of structure, production of dust and fumes, and, and, and uh, lighting, and design compatibility. Well, we think that if we use the strategy of building a point system into each one of these, then by accruing these different point values, then we can start to create ranges where uh, you start to define what is a low, a medium, and a high impact use. Um, one of the problems with this scenario-based uh, a strategy, which is something that we're trying to work through, um, is that there is no real guaranteed minimum uh, across the board for all the properties. Um, so beyond leading to unnecessary complexities, not only for staff to be able to review the plans, but for architects, designers, and developers to understand what it is they need to design for, we definitely want to make sure that um, we resolve these complexities so that it makes it uh, easier to use code across the board, um, and that it accounts for existing build conditions that, that are already existing. Key West is not a blank slate. It's been around you know, almost 100 years now. Um, so there are portions of it that have already been built out for uh, a, a long periods of time, and uh, we're not gonna tear down those buildings only because they don't uh, meet certain re requirements. So what we would do is recommend that um, there are mechanisms in the code that ensure that there's no net loss of public benefit when a site gets developed. So there's a transfer or trade-off um, if some uh, requirements can cannot be met, then they're transferred elsewhere on the property to ensure that those benefits are still there for the community. One of these examples is um, the way that the planting requirements are met. They're measured in units. Um, uh, and as I said, 
uh, in our staff meeting earlier today, we don't know if we love or hate the unit strategy because it has both pros and cons. Um, uh, the good thing about it um, is that it, it is not a prescriptive strategy. Um, by having, by having uh, these, these unit strategies that allows designers to use them in different methods, it does not create circumstances where you end up with a cookie cutter environment, but it actually promotes opportunities for design and innovation through creativity. The bad thing about them is that again, they do not um, uh, ensure a minimum level of service across their implementation. So for example, if your lot requires, as Richard said earlier, 40 units of landscaping, you could, put, you could put in 40 shrubs, one gallon shrubs, but not necessarily provide any canopy that would provide ample shade, any habitat, or that would have a greater value for carbon sequestration when you start to talk about creating a more, a more sustainable um, environment. What we want to do also is to recommend building in value uh, adjustments into that unit score system um, to encourage higher unit credits for canopy trees and vegetation that is drought tolerant and provides a greater level of sustainability for, for, for the area. So for example, if you're in less than half an acre, you're required to provide 40 units of planting. Um, so you could provide four trees uh, uh, or a combination or 40 shrubs, um, but you're not guaranteed that you're going to get any kind of canopy because you could go with all the shrubs. You could put in one tree and no shrubs. Um, so we don't think that it's the most effective way of ensuring a good cross-section of landscaping uh, to meet the minimum requirements. What we would do instead, and, it, it start, and we started to play with numbers, is to give a higher value of uh, Key West native um, canopy trees of a higher scale so that those are the ones that get the greatest value because ultimately those are the ones that give us the better trade-off. They um, increase our property values, they provide shade, um, in that shade, it increases the lifespan of your hardscape on your, on your property, um, and it helps to minimize the heat island effect that affects the entire community. Um, for smaller trees, for subcanopy trees, then we would decrease that value to five points, I mean to three points. Um, for shrubs that are Florida native, that meet a minimum three gallon size, then you would get two points versus the one point that you would get for any other shrub, maybe a one gallon loriope ground cover. Now when we look at differences between New Town and Old Town, we absolutely want to be responsive to the built out conditions that, are, that, that already exist. So in the language we are going to be exploring, um, assurances that landscape is not installed in a way that's detrimental to the historic quality of structures that, are, that, 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 that we have. Um, and that where a historic built out condition exists, um, that a certain requirement cannot be met, then we would allow for the transfer of those unit values elsewhere on the property as a second choice. If the property is so built out that uh, those requirements cannot be met, then there, there would be a mechanism by which payment into a tree fund um, or some other means of mitigation can be addressed so that there is no net loss, okay? What we don't want to do is um, promote environments where people are, have the incentive of overdeveloping their, their lots and not providing a benefit to the community. Um, we also want to have best practices uh, uh, for the horticultural sustainability of the vegetation. Um, one of the things that the, that the existing code has is that it has a reference for an allowance of a three and a half foot berm 
um, which we just don't think is applicable to the Key West context. Uh, so we will altogether scratch that out. Um, we would ensure that there are minimum clearances of canopy trees from building facades so that you don't have building facades, grow, uh, uh, trees growing into building facades. Because typically what happens is that um, if you have a historic structure, your historic structure is perceived to have a greater value than the tree. So you would trim the tree so that it's not rubbing against the, the, the facade and damaging it. Well, if the tree is planted too close from the facade, then the structural stability and the balance of that tree is put into question in a situation of a high wind event that that tree is very, has a high susceptibility of falling over and creating additional damage. So we definitely want to stay away from, from that. We want to look at opportunities for requiring foundation planting to mitigate the disparities between the new finished floor elevations that FEMA is going to be requiring and the existing grades, because now to meet the new finished floor elevations, buildings are going to have to be elevated. There's going to be less of a connection to the street. The ability to, to use landscaping to mitigate that scale, um, we think is a great strategy. Of course, ensure line of sight definitions and, and, and allowances so that when you get to an intersection, if you're in a vehicle, your, your visibility of oncoming traffic is not obstructed. Um, and of course, discouraging the use of sod as a preferred ground, ground cover. Um, we think that sod is very water intensive. It doesn't create habitat, and it's not the best choice for a ground cover uh, quality. One of the other things that we're really looking at is the quality of the front edge of these properties, particularly as they're read from the street. Um, so we definitely want to make sure that there's language in there that requires that landscape buffers do not encroach on the public right of way, particularly um, with vegetation that have spines or that may be hazardous to individuals that are walking uh, on the sidewalk. Um, require that front landscape buffers meet a high degree of maintenance um, and ensure that the front buffers do not barricade, do not create walls that disconnect the frontage of the buildings to the public realm. Uh, this is important because when we talk about having safe streets, having a sense of community, having eyes on, uh, on the street, the last thing we want to do is to have landscaping that is creating huge walls of, of um, of separation. Um, when we talk about uh, continuing uh, this idea of the well-maintained landscape, um, uh, we, we want to start talking about possibly uh, piggybacking on the Monroe County uh, a requirement of requiring a minimum of two canopy trees on single family lots, even though the single family lot landscape requirements right now are pretty much nil. Um, so at a minimum, start to increase the building, the, the green footprint of the residential areas. Um, particularly important in Newtown where th there, are, there are much less trees than in, than in Old Town. And ensure that in commercial properties, in multifamily properties, um, that the vegetation that's been put in as a product of um, the LDRs that are looking to improve the overall quality of the community will remain there in perpetuity. So we're looking at exploring opportunities for ensuring that there's an annual reinspection process, either done by city staff, by a city managed consultant, or by a professional landscape architect or landscape professional who is certified by, by the city that can certify that all the plants that were a requirement of the site plan approval process still remain and are still alive. So that if a tree dies, then that tree has to get replaced to ensure that the canopy remains and that the overall uh, green footprint of the city uh, is, is, is maintained. We also wanna look at species selection. Um, when we look at the code, there is, um, a large plethora of planting selections that, that are there. We definitely believe in uh, 
as a landscape architect myself, we appreciate the opportunity to be able to explore and be innovative with, with, with design, but we definitely want to encourage the use of appropriate vegetation for the local conditions. Um, so we want to create a preferred list of vegetation that, is, that, that, that deals with uh, Florida Keys natives um, that are most suited for uh, our environment, such as the gumbo limbo, the Jamaican dogwood, the mahogany trees, uh, buttonwoods and pigeon plum as our, as our predominantly valuable canopy trees. And as you see in the picture on the right, um, ensuring that we reinforce ideas of right tree, right place, so that large canopy trees are not planted underneath overhead utility wires, that then FPL will come in and V-cut. And essentially, um, while protecting the overhead utility, creating a potential hazard in that tree, because by lion tailing it and uh, 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 taking its balance off kilter, they're actually making that more of a hazardous condition. And we don't think that that's the kind of environment that Key West wants to have. Uh, when we talk about the relationship of landscape and urbanization, we definitely want to look at building in design standards to ensure that the frontage of um, plantings contribute to the overall streetscape. What this will do is that this will take um, this will build a partnership between the development community that's improving their lots and the city who's going to be responsible for improving the streetscapes to work together towards a common goal. That will facilitate um, issues of ease of visibility, provide increased shade, long-term maintenance for storm preparedness, um, promote the use of structural soils and root barriers so that trees are not ripping up sidewalks, creating potential liability situations for the city in terms of ADA access, um, and allowing possible uh, uh, tree planters, raised, raised planters um, on private property that can actually abut the property line so that you can actually gain more soil depth for better tree growth. Um, to a maximum height of 18 inches, where now that, that, that the wall of that elevated uh, planter can now serve as a potential seat wall so that it starts to contribute to potentially a narrow sidewalk that cannot accommodate seating, for example. When we look at the local geology, um, we know that in Key West is not enough to dig a hole and plant a tree and watch it grow. Um, we have to make space for that tree to grow because of the oolite substrate that we have. So we would require, at a minimum, a 36 inch uh, uh, a minimum excavation of all tree, tree planting areas to ensure that these root growths have areas where they can actually grow and anchor. Remember that when a tree is well anchored, it has a greater susceptibility of sustaining a high windy wind because it's, 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 it's better attached to the ground. Um, we would uh, create minimums for, for example, a 64 uh, foot square foot area minimum per tree and build some opportunities for maybe these elevated uh, uh, tree planters uh, to work in concert with that. We also think it's really important to ensure that general contractors, when they plant a tree, they don't dig a hole and fill, backfill the um, the tree, uh, the, the soil with debris from their construction site. It's much cheaper to do that. But at the long term, it's a detriment to the tree and a detriment to an asset that we think is of value to the community. So we would, we're exploring opportunities to ensure that the landscape architect or the landscape pro pro professional for whom the general contractor is working um, will come and inspect and certify that the backfill is good quality soil, that it's not full of debris and it doesn't have construction material in there that will be detrimental to the overall growth uh, of the tree. When, when we look at streetscapes specifically, um, we want to recognize that right now, the streetscape conditions, particularly throughout Old Town, are uh, filled with parking. 
parking actually has a huge demand on the ability and the potential of these streetscapes to actually become walkable, tree-lined streets because so much, of, so much of, uh, of the streets has to meet the parking needs that are there. Um, so we recognize that at least in Old Town, it's gonna require some coordination with new parking garage uh, solutions so that we can start to alleviate these streets from, ha from having to meet those, those, those parking needs so that we can start to free up some of that space um, uh, to have parklets, uh, street trees, and public amenities um, uh, similar to what uh, Diana had spoken at the last workshop if you were here. Um, we also wanna look at um, uh, looking at this issue of walkability. Uh, we think that, and, and, and we're still toying with the numbers, but we think that if you live in a highly walkable environment, such as Old Town, um, where you can access just about everything within a short distance of walking, then maybe the parking requirements can be reduced or reduced substantially, right? So that what, what we're doing is um, tapping into the fact that a, that a large number of residents use bicycles and use alternate means of transportation don't rely on vehicles to move about the city. Um, so we wanna recognize the local culture and the local qu qu quality as an asset to be able to create more opportunities for, for, for streetscapes. Um, so while Old Town will focus more on creating a greater emphasis of upgrading that relationship between the buildings, the properties, and the streets to create the circumstances where that potential can be exercised. Um, in Newtown, we, ac we actually think that because it's gonna be a product, a product of redevelopment, um, uh, then a lot of these streetscape conditions can actually be uh, trade-offs that are a requirement of new development when they come in. So when a new project will come in, it will provide co the continuity of street trees. It will provide uh, enhanced paving environments. It will provide seating, bike racks, uh, public amenities, and public space, so that again, that environment uh, starts to have some synchronicity with the quality of environment and the level of service that is being uh, 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 found right now in Old Town. We're, all, we're actually looking at making the recommendations that a, a street tree master plan is looked at from the city's perspective. Um, this will help to ensure that, a, that good quality canopy trees and continuity of the green vegetation is implemented um, systematically throughout, throughout, throughout the city. Um, this can help uh, to provide many valuable assets such as establishing a hierarchy of street types, um, particularly if you're a tourist that comes in, a, a residential street can look a certain way, a commercial street can look a certain way. So it starts to create a sense of wayfinding. Um, of course, it creates a continuity of shade which will have uh, 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 greater uh, opportunities for walkability. Um, and of course, it'll provide the mechanisms by which we can address issues of safety with side triangles, and again, this issue of um, the overhead utility wires. So it can, it can work in concert. If you have a street tree master plan, you can start to make tangible decisions about where can overhead utility wires be explored to be undergrounded for the benefit of the community. Um, so it gives a platform so that dialogue and that conversation can actually occur. Lastly, we wanna look at signage. Um, and one of the things, and our, our, our look at signage is exclusive to the Newtown area. Um, we're not writing uh, our regulations for signage in Old Town, uh, even though we definitely are gonna be working 
very closely with HARC um, in ensuring that while there is gonna be some level of difference, that at least from a definition standpoint, from an implementation standpoint, from a quality standpoint, that there is some continuity and some dialogue between both of, both of these um, environments. In Newtown specifically, we see that there are signs everywhere. There's so much signage that is competing against each other that at the end of the day, you just don't see anything because your eyes just filter er er everything out. It becomes visual white noise. So what we want to do is build a paradigm where signage can, be, can have an, an efficacious use of promoting the businesses that are there but are not creating um, uh, a visual eyesore for the community. One of the ways that we're, that, we're, that we're looking at this is to tie the size of signage to visibility and reaction time. So instead of arbitrarily de uh, uh, de determining that a sign can only be uh, no more than a certain dimension, we start to look at the fact that the roadway has a speed limit of 35 miles per hour. It's not a 60 mile per hour roadway where you're zooming by in a vehicle. So it helps us decrease the size of that sign because in, in essence, the lower the driving speed, the more time drivers have to see the sign, the more time the drivers have to see the sign, the smaller the sign can actually become. It doesn't have to be so big. It doesn't have to scream out at you, you know, that we're here. So we're, we're using uh, the United States Sign Council standards as an absolute baseline for the maximum sign dimensions. Um, uh, in, 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 in automobile driven environments, um, in, in car centric neighborhoods, the reaction time is typically 10 to 12 seconds. Right? You have 12 seconds to see a sign, make a decision if you want to change lane, pull into the property, and not run over another vehicle in, in the process. Because the speed limit is lower, we can actually look at a slower reaction time of six to eight, um, six to eight seconds, um, which will allow us to, again, bring the dimension of that sign to a, to a smaller scale. This will allow us to reduce the maximum height and will allow us to also start to postulate, well, do signs just sit in a sea of grass or do they also have some improvements such as landscaping so that they become amenities of the um, experience as you drive through the city? Um, when we look at the confluence of signage to urban design and we start to think about a new paradigm of redeveloping new town, where buildings are no longer set back behind, be, behind 200 feet of asphalt parking, but now the buildings are actually pushed closer to the right of way, then the visibility of the signs become much more front and center. So again, it gives us an opportunity to make the signage much more efficacious and to build its efficiency by uh, 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 mediating it with that six to eight second response time. Um, some of the language that we're gonna have um, in the sign code um, is gonna be uh, talking about the design features and the architectural quality of the sign, um, uh, such as um, proper material choices, and a really important one is continuity and consistency of sign type on a single parcel. If you go to Sears Town, there's 40 establishments, 80 different sign types, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's visual clutter. And what we want to do is promote um, a, 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 a better way of creating that signage with enough flexibility so that it facilitates brand recognizable brands to still be able to market themselves in a way that are recognizable to the to 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 their patrons um, again ensuring that adequate landscaping is provided for posts or monument signs 
and overall eliminating uh, the overwhelming billboard-like signage um, uh, that, that we find for some of these commercial properties. Um, one of the interesting things that we found in the code is a language that says that uh, flat and facade signs outside of the historic district shall not be regulated to area. So the sign can be as big as the building. And we think that this is detrimental to the overall quality and the overall aesthetic value that the city can actually have. So this is something that we definitely want to step away from and start to build tangible, implementable parameters that are understandable both from the property owner side and from the staff level side so that there's clear understanding as to what is required and what to design for. Uh, one, of the, one of the metrics that we're looking at is to potentially look at taking the addition of all the facade area facing a street and taking the aggregated amount of all the facade area and saying that all your sign frontage cannot exceed 10% of that overall value without being prescriptive. So we don't want to say every property is going to have a monument sign, every property is going to have a wall sign, but what we want to do is similar to the plant unit strategy, build a point system for different sign types so that different businesses types can distribute that point value over what type of sign best suits their business type. Um, and we think that that um, can build a certain level of flexibility and can help to uh, 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 rein in uh, the overall visual pollution that we're actually experiencing um, on, on Roosevelt. Um, with the addition that we also are gonna have maximum dimensional qualities to these signs. So if you do wanna have a monument sign, you use a certain point value, but the monument sign cannot be bigger than a certain size, okay? So that again, we're stepping away from the large billboard. The very difficult task of coming into compliance is always a very tricky one. Um, uh, so we're looking at a two-pronged approach. Um, looking at a possible amortization schedule where window and facade signs, for example, have a five-year window to get upgraded. For, as for commercial establishments that remain throughout, that five, uh, throughout those five years. Pole and monument signs would have to be upgraded within the 10-year maximum, or all the signage has to be upgraded to the new code if there's a change of tenant, if there's a new sign, if there's a new building permit for, this, for sign replacement or sign reconstruction. Um, and establishing an absolute deadline for compliance at the 10-year mark. So we think that 10 years is a reasonable time to give properties um, uh, who've recently established a, a Im investment on a sign to be able to get their, their return on investment for that, uh, for that, um, for that investment. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to um, Richard. And I know that we've given you a lot um, to chew on. Before we get into to any sort of question or discussion, I just wanted to make sure everybody understood sort of where, so, you know, where do we go from here? What's up, what's, what's next? Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a workshop tomorrow evening. Um, and then in October, uh, from, well, starting tonight probably, through, through October, uh, we'll begin preparing those, these draft illustrations, um, sort of bringing forward, formalizing these, these design concepts and regulations and then submitting the draft workshop, I'm sorry, submitting the draft changes um, to staff in, in, in November. Um, as we work through and refine those into a, a more of a formal document, we would look to, to publish that on, on the webpage and then look to hold a, a fifth community workshop to sort of review what, what the majority of those changes are. So it'll be a summary of sort of the, of the four meetings that we had.
Um, one thing we envisioned is whether we do it on a weekend, whether we do a, a Friday open house where we're here all day, where if somebody wants to come in and have, you know, answer questions or if they can't make it, um, and then have a Saturday workshop, we can certainly do it on a Wednesday or Thursday. Um, it's just we wanted to make ourselves available um, throughout the day and throughout the evening for that, for that final document. Um, February, March, um, Planning Commission, uh, we're actually planning for, for two meetings and then ultimately uh, City Commission um, in, uh, in April and May. 